Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. On today's Your Take, I talk to an acclaimed British actress known for her roles on stage, television and film. My guest made a television screen debut in an episode of Dixon of Dot Green in 1972. She went on to play nurse Catty Shaw in the TV series General Hospital, Susan Prothero in the historical drama By the Sword Divided from 1983 to 1985. Other roles include Blake Seven, The Sweeney, Rising Damp, Bergerac, Lovejoy, On the Up, and the films Ace is High, The Likely Lads, and The Big Sleep. My guest also joined the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1979, where she played principal roles until 1982, receiving great critical acclaim for Betrayal of Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, and Iphigenia in The Greeks. She's also married to the actor Jeffrey Holland, famous for his roles in Heidi High and You Rang My Lord, and also a previous Your Take guest. Today I'm joined by Judy Buxton. We talk about Judy's early life, the career on stage, television and film, and married life. <laughs> a warm welcome on this Tuesday morning oh, to Your Take. Thank you, James. It's lovely to be here and to, to be able to talk to you. I shall look forward to it very much. Thank you kindly for, for joining me. And we're obviously going to be talking in some detail about your career and how it all began and what you've done on, on stage and screen. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, I always like to wind the clock back to kind of the very beginning. So we go back to the late 1940s, in fact, 1949, October, <laughs> October the 7th, I'm sure you can remember it very well, in Croydon, <laughs> Surrey. <laughs> Firstly, I wanted to ask about what your upbringing was like. Mm -hmm. And can you just give us some background on your parents, who they were, what they did for a living, and do you have any siblings? Right, well, as you say, I was born in Croydon um, and my parents were fantastic parents. They really were. They were very supportive in everything I did. And my sister, I do have a sister. Uh, she's three years older than I am, uh, but she didn't go into the uh, acting profession at all. She became a nurse, actually, a children's nurse. And my father, used, well, he was a sales director of, um, um, of metal, of white metal. So he... he worked in Mitcham um, at Fry's Metal Foundries. And my mother met him there, I believe, <laughs> when she worked also as a secretary um, at the company. And although I think she'd been engaged to somebody else, she eventually uh, decided to marry my father. And they had a very happy marriage. Um, he was just divine, my father. Everybody was in love with him. He was a, what you'd call a gentle man. He was very, very placid, put up with a lot from three women, my sister, myself, and my mother. Because she was quite a domineering character, my mother, although, I mean, wonderful. She had a huge amount of friends. She was very outgoing. She, you know, loved fashion and makeup. And uh, I think she would have really liked to have been an actress herself. The, um, obviously the, the opportunity wasn't there at the time, but I think she did a little bit of amateur dramatics in her youth. Mm. And so sort of really she was responsible for me going into this profession. And I'll tell you a story. I was two and three quarters and she packed me off to a little nursery school, which was just up the road. Uh, quite an early age to be packed off to a school. And the teacher there was German. Her name was Miss Ritz. She had a very, very strong accent. And so the children didn't pick the accent up, as kids probably would. Uh, she, she employed an elocution teacher. In those days, they were called, not drama teachers, they were called elocution teachers. And so all the little kids, myself included, used to do poems and um, perform little bits and bobs. And I 
presumably um, sort of had a, had a good uh, a shining to it, you know, I, I took to it and enjoyed it. And so I then went on right through my schooling uh, to do drama classes every Saturday, not with the same woman. Uh, my mother found um, a lady called Mrs. Mitchell, who was also local. So, but I used to go to Saturday afternoon drama classes with her right up until the age I went to uh, drama school at the age of 18. And I used to do festivals and um, exams. Uh, I won quite a few medals and, um, you know, got, got quite a few qualifications and, you know, quite enjoyed it. Well, I did enjoy it very much. And it sort of, it was then that I knew that's what I wanted to do. That when I left school, I would go to drama school. And that's exactly what happened. I'm going to pick up. Mm. Sorry, I'm going to pick up <laughs> shortly on your the time at drama school, which you mentioned you went to at 18. But I think this is a good point to move on to your schooling mm, mm. where you went to Croydon High School. Were your school years, were they happy times in your life and what subjects did you excel in? And from an early age, I think you've already kind of answered this already, but did you have any early career aspirations? Yes, well, after I'd been to the little nursery school, I then actually went to a, a school called Cromehurst which my sister was at. And then at the age of 11, I did the 11 plus, in those days it was called the 11 plus, and I then got into Croydon High School, which was considered a very, very good school. And um, had a very happy time there, made lots of friends, and um, I enjoyed my schooling very much. I hated anything to do with the sciences or maths, so I was much better at doing languages and uh, the arts. And I did appear in a few school plays. Um, but again, it was my Saturday, my Saturday afternoon extra drama classes out of school that was more, you know, very important to me. And that's when I was sent off to do all these festivals and things. And, and talking about my father and my mother, I mean, Dad was always very good at take ferrying me about in the car, you know, pick me up and take me there, you know, marvelous. And you, you don't appreciate that at the time, you know, do you? You 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 think about it later, and you think, God, he he was he put up with a lot, you know. Um, and so, yes, schooling was good. Um, I enjoyed it, and I stayed there until I'd done my A levels. That was um, a sort of stipulation mum and dad wanted me to get my qualifications and that got me into Rose Bruford's where I spent three years. I have to say that the extra drama classes I used to round about the age of 14, 15 all my friends were on a Saturday afternoon were going off into Croydon and um, looking around the shops and having coffee in coffee bars and buying records and all that and I did get a little bit resentful I think because I had to go and do my, my drama. Sure. And so I got a little bit just around that time, but I'm glad I continued and, um, you know, the rest is history, really. It is indeed. And shortly we'll come on to your time at um, Rose Bruford, which you've briefly mentioned, but I kind of wanted to pick up, you said at, at school, you were particularly interested in things that were creative. You were interested in performance. And interestingly, so far, you've painted a portrait of family life, but you didn't necessarily come from a performance background. But what was it that kind of inspired you to perform? Were there any actors or actresses at the time that you'd seen on stage or, or on screen, for example, on television or, or in Hollywood that were kind of an early inspiration? And yeah. if, if so, who, who were they and why did they kind of inspire you? I was always mad about Lucille Ball. We used to watch that at home and I just thought she was wonderful. She was hysterically funny, she was incredibly beautiful and I just thought she, the, her comedy was fantastic and I think she was a, she was a sort of influence on me in a way because we used to watch that a lot um, when we were at, at home. Um, and I just admired her and I 
I'd always loved comedy. Um, another thing, <laughs> I actually loved the cowboy films, the black and white cowboy films. The westerns, and the old westerns. The old westerns. <clears throat> and I always thought it would be terribly romantic to be in a, in a western as, you know, the girl in the check shirt and the denim jeans and getting on the horse and then riding off into the sunset with the, with the very handsome cowboy. <laughs> but of course it never happened. But I did use, that was a little, little fantasy of mine, I suppose. Um, but we, as I said, we did lots of school plays and um, I was usually cast in, in those. And um, I don't know, I suppose, I do remember once going to, I think it was, it was some, it was some lecture that uh, Dame Sybil Thorndike was involved in. And I'm, I cannot for the life of me remember where it was, but I was about 11 at the time. And I'd gone to it, it was in, in London, and Judy Dench and John Stride were performing Romeo and Juliet at the Old Vic at the time. And they were involved in this, they were doing a little scene from it in this lecture. And I have a picture of myself at the age of 11 with a friend, and there's Dame Sybil Thorndike, and there's Judy Dench at a very early age and doing this wonderful scene. And I suppose in a way, I mean, I think she's just a wonderful actress. And it just seems strange that then I didn't know that I would then be playing Juliet at the Royal Shakespeare Company. At the, you know, I wouldn't have known that at the time, but that I think back on that and think that's extraordinary, really. And since then, I haven't worked with Judy, but I've worked with her daughter, Finty, Finty Williams, who's divine. And I took the photo to show Finty, and she took it back to show her mum. Oh, <laughs> All those years ago. Yeah, incredibly, yeah. we'll come on to um, your time at the Royal Shakespeare yes, Company shortly. I wanted to pick up on your time at drama school because you you trained at um, a drama school called Rose Bruford College in the South London suburb of Sidcup. That's right. I wanted to ask how long you were there for and what did the experience teach you about the art and craft of acting? And did it give you the skills and knowledge to go on and work as a professional actress? Right, well, I went to Bruford's because it did a combined teaching and acting course. And my parents were a little wary, obviously, of just you know going straight up off into the theatre. They wanted me to have something to fall back on. And this seemed mm. like a very good idea that you came away after it was a three year course and you came away with um, a certificate, a diploma uh, for teaching, which in fact I have never used. <laughs> I had to do the teaching course and found it incredibly daunting because the kids were only about a year or so older than me. And I mean, I was only a year or so older than them. And to, to go into a school like that and, and do a bit of drama was terrifying, but I got through it. But I knew I never really wanted to do the teaching. So Bruford itself um, was great. It was beautiful setting in Lamerby Park in Sidcup. Um, brilliant teachers. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I know some people didn't. Um, I think some people found it was a bit restricting. I don't know, but I loved it. And I think it taught me, first of all, discipline. To be an actor, you've got to be very disciplined um, and you have to be able to take rejection. Uh, you have to take criticism. And all that is quite, quite hard to do. Um, especially uh, the actual discipline of being punctual. And mm. um, that is such a thing that gets me very cross if people aren't punctual at rehearsals and hold people up or, you know, I'm always early for something. I, I tend to be anyway, uh, unless something, you know, terrible's happened that uh, like you, the train's broken down or whatever. But no, um, at, from that point of view, um, we also did an awful lot of voice work. Um, in fact, when we first, got there they they recorded your voice as it was when you first arrived and then recorded it when you left and then played the two to you and it was extraordinary how it had changed you know I was right up there at the time when I was like that and then amazing so I thought that was quite a clever thing to do really 
Um, so yes, um, lots of movement, um, mime. The only thing we didn't do, which would have been nice, um, we didn't do tele a lot of television work. In fact, we didn't do any. I and mean, I'm sure in drama schools now, they all do film courses and TV, mm. how, you know, how to act on TV. It's very different from, from theatre. Um, but no, we didn't do that. We did some radio though. So it was mainly, mainly theatre and radio. After graduating from uh, drama school, can you recall your first paid job or role? And can you describe that particular experience? Yes. I, I actually um, got nine months work in repertory which doesn't happen now, really. It, it was a, a good craft, um, learning your craft, nine months of being an acting ASM, making the tea for the cast. Um, this was all in, at a um, theatre called Ches in Chesterfield called the, well, it's now called the Pomegranate. Um, it's now the Civic Theatre Chesterfield um, and in Derbyshire. And I, I got in there because the director who ran it, he'd actually directed me at Rose Bruford's. He'd done a little production that I was in. And um, that's really how I got my first big job. And I was there in Chesterfield for nine months with the late Lewis Collins, who went on to do the professionals. And he was an acting ASM as well as me. So we were starting off together. And we did a play every two weeks. Uh, now, I wasn't in all the plays, as I say, I was um, sometimes doing the props or man I hated doing the book when, when you had to actually run the show. So I was terrified. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm a bit clueless on things like lighting and sound and pressing buttons. It's all a bit, a bit daunting. But you know, I wanted to be out there doing, doing the shows. But um, eventually I got to play some really nice parts and I was there literally for nine months. So yeah, it was a good grounding that, really good grounding. But sadly that doesn't happen nowadays. I don't think, you know, people do learn their crafts from, from the old days when you, you know, you were playing one character one week and different character in the next two weeks, learning one, performing one. So it was hard work, it was hard work, but enjoyable. And that actually gained me my equity card, which you had to do, I think it was, 42 weeks work before you became a, a full mem uh, member of equity. From gaining your equity card and talking about a solid good grounding on, on stage and obviously a, a fine education at drama school, mm. we move now to the, the medium of television and we turn the clock back now to the early 1970s. In fact, mm. 1972, when you made your television debut in an episode of Dixon of Doc Green. How did that opportunity happen? And how did it lead to other significant television roles such as General Hospital, The Sweeney, Public Eye, Get Some In, Rising Damp, and of course, the sci-fi show, Blake Seven? Oh, yes. Well, actually, um, I got an agent after I'd uh, left um, Chesterfield. And she put me up for these, all these parts. Um, she was quite friendly, I think, with the director um, of Dixon. His name was Veer Lorimer. And he also did Blake Seven. Um, and so I went and had an interview with him and I read for him and I was given the part. I, I cannot for the life of me remember very much about it. I do know that I was extremely nervous um, when we were at the BBC, we did some outside filming. And what was strange was actually we filmed in a park very near where I live now. Um, but at the time, I didn't, I didn't know London. I was still living at home after I'd, after I'd come out of Chesterfield. I went back to live with my parents. And um, so there I was in this park filming. And then we went into the studio, the BBC. Mm. And I remember there was... Um, a wonderful actor called Paddy O'Connell, who was playing my dad. I think he went on to do The Brothers, actually. And he, before the, before the actual recording, we went into the, um, into the bar at the BBC. 
and he, he bought me a brandy. <laughs> which was the last thing I should have done. You know, Com I Com never... Calms the nerves, though, doesn't it? In I know, but you see, I would never have... I mean, in a million years, I would never drink before doing any recording. But I did. I mean, I didn't have any bad effects, but I just remember thinking back on it and thinking, my God, I should never have done that. <laughs> but anyway, we got through it. And as I say, I don't really... I don't remember what it was about haven't got a clue and of course now I don't think you can get them I don't well I've never seen it you may maybe on Amazon or something I don't know do you think but, that do you think that sort of early breakthrough and you've mentioned that you had a an agent back then as well do you think it kind of inevitably sort of led to other opportunities particularly on screen Oh, yes. I mean, she would put me up for things and, um, you know, that one thing sometimes leads to another. Um, I remember going for General Hospital. That was came completely out of the blue. I, I think I'd had a couple of interviews for, for, some, for things that day. And I remember my mum was with me. And they wanted a nurse who was more like Barbara Windsor. That was the brief. And of course, I was nothing like her. I mean, you know, she's the sort of buxom little blonde, you know, and I was just so different. But apparently, so the story goes, the producer, Ian Fordyce, interviewed me. And apparently at the time, he said it was my eyes that got me the job. He said that I just looked at him. <laughs> And he said, that's my Katie Shaw. And that's that's what happened. So the, the blonde Barbara Windsor type was blown out the window. And uh, so I, I ended up playing Nurse Katie Shaw, which was a huge thing for me. It was twice weekly and um, a very good grounding in, in, in television work. In those days, we actually recorded, it, it was live, but it wasn't live, if you see what I mean. It, we didn't have an audience or anything like that but you had to sort of whiz through the program, hopefully in one take and do the pickups afterwards. Um, so it, it wasn't like rehearse record or anything like that. Um, and I was working with the wonderful Linda Bellingham, the late Winda, Linda Bellingham, who's just terrific to work with. She was the other nurse. We were like the sort of double act really. And when I know she, when she got the job, she was supposed to be this rather um, big, nurse you know um, and she she put big padding on and she went for the audition like that and she padded herself all up which <laughs> she got the job so that the only thing was that when she used to have to get into her nurse's uniform they used to have to put padding on her <laughs> every every time interestingly would you say the the process in working in television back in the 70s would you say it was a, a much quicker process than maybe later on or today? No, no, um, it wasn't. We had wonderful rehearsal periods, you see. Right. They didn't do okay. that. We, mm. we used to go and rehearse at Elstree in the, in the um, rehearsal room there. And then we'd, re we'd do, as far as I can remember, we'd probably do a read, all read through round a table, all the cast and the, uh, the people that came in as guest stars. And then we'd rehearse, say, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then we do a producer's run through in the rehearsal room. And then say Saturday, Sunday, we do the, it would be the proper recording day. And then you'd have a day off and then you'd start again the next week. So, but nowadays with television, I don't think they get any time at all. I think it's mm. literally, you learn your lines at home, have hardly any rehearsal and you have to do it so I would say it was much harder now much more frightening interestingly from an actress's point of view and the way you come to a performance and develop a, a character and prepare for a part do you find that do you prefer having a long rehearsal period or do you prefer coming into it a little bit more fresher and maybe more improvised well, for theatre, I think you do need rehearsals and you need, you need because you need to explore it and try different things and see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and, and, you know, hone it, especially with comedy and you, you, all the timings and everything. Obviously, um, 
with the television, I think I, pre I would prefer to have a, a, you know, little rehearsal, but I mean, obviously in film, you, you get, you might just do a little rehearsal and then, then do a take, and then it is more spontaneous, but it's a totally different medium. You know, you, it's, um, theatre is much more out there, projection, um, working to an audience, Television is and film is so much more um, contained. The, so. the, men, the mention of cinema, which I have to profess, is probably my first love and my favourite medium. Mm. We come on to the feature film, and you've performed in um, a number of feature films over the years. Do you have a, a favourite moment or experience working on a film set? And how do you find the, the process of... Um, working on a feature film? Well, I have to admit that, okay, I've done a few films, but I would say my parts in the films a spit in the cough, really. I mean, they were no great big parts. They were all little parts. I might just go down to Pinewood Studios mm. for a day um, and probably earn about 50 quid <laughs> at the time. Uh, so I was never on a film for long enough, really. You know, they were just little little bit parts, really. Um, I did have quite a funny moment with The Likely Lads, which is shown quite a lot. These, In fact, it was on the other day. Um, I met James Bolan for the first time on the set. I'd been in makeup and I'd come down and literally introduced to him and said, uh, oh, this is, this is James Bowen, and this is Julie Buxton. Hello, hello, how do you do? Next minute, we're snogging on the set because it's this in the script, you know? And I was just like, oh my God, I've only just met him. <laughs> so that was hilarious. I always forget, I always um, remember that. It was very funny. You know, you no time to sort of get to know anybody. It was just right, action. And that was it. So that was quite, uh, quite funny. But the rest of it, I mean, I did a bit in um, The Big Sleep with Robert Mitchum and, um, oh, it was um, Oliver Reed was in that. And uh, also I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about Oliver Reed, to be honest, um, because in preparation for our conversation today, I was looking at your Facebook page and I saw a, a photograph with you and, and Oliver Reed. Mm. Did, did you know him well? What, what was he like as a, a personality? I only met him like briefly like that, you know, but Michael Winner was directing it. And, um, <laughs> excuse me, and... Um, he was a little bit like that as a director not being rude, wasn't he, uh, Michael Winner? A little, a little bit like Marmite not being... Uh, yes. Yeah. Say no more. Um, but he um, he wanted all this publicity, of course. And so, you know, I was sort of plonked on Oliver Reed's knee and then he would start mucking around with my hair and things. And it was all, all sort of photos for publicity. I never had a scene with him. Um, I never had a scene with Robert Mitchum. But again, I was photographed with him. And uh, I remember him once. <laughs> I, I was with him. He's a big bloke. And um, I was there and I I sort of, he, I think the photographer said, put your head on on um, Robert's shoulder and things. And I he said, I don't even know this girl. So I looked up at him and I said, I said, no, but I think we're engaged. <laughs> it was hilarious. But that's what happened, you know, um, it was all for the publicity. And actually Michael Winner wanted me to when the film came out, I had one line in that film, I can remember it. I said, I was a receptionist and he'd sent me to Marks and Spencer's to go and buy myself a white shirt that morning. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I was sitting there, it was in some, it was off Oxford Street, some um, place which was meant to be sort of a club. And um, I was the receptionist and I had to say, Mr. Mars, there's a Mr. Marlowe to see. And that was it. That was the whole thing. And Michael Winner, when the film came out, which was about a year or so later, apparently asked my agent if I would go to South Africa with him to promote the film. Can you believe it? Well, fortunately, 
I was working. I was working at the Theatre Royal in Windsor and there was no way I could go to South Africa. And I thought, oh my God, can you imagine going to South? Why me? I've got one line in this. Anyway, I never did. Um, I was doing this play. And then years later, he was uh, directing a remake of The Wicked Lady that mm -hmm. Margaret Lockwood had made years before. And I was summoned to go and see him at his office. Well, actually it was at his house. Um, for a part in it. Anyway, I sat down, this was a few years and I'd been to the RSC by then. And I sat down and the first thing he said to me was, my dear, it'll cost you very dearly in your film career. You never did that publicity for me. And I just said, Michael, I said, I got you thousands of pounds worth of publicity and photographs. And I said, I couldn't go because I was working. That is why. So he said, well, what have you been doing over the last few years? I said, well, I've just played Juliet at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and that was it. So not my favorite person. I think this moves on, I think this moves on to a, a nice point because we've spoken about your dealings with Michael Winner, working for a Hollywood giant one of my favourites, Robert Mitchum, Robert. In, a, in a remake of the great Howard Hawks film, uh, The Big Sleep. I yeah. love the original. I've never seen the, the remake, so I do apologise. Well, I shouldn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> we, we come on to your time famously at the Royal Shakespeare Company when you joined in the late 1970s, in 1979. Yeah. That's right. Tell us about your time working for the company and your thoughts on performing... Shakespeare's work on stage and is there a particular stage play or production which is memorable and why? Right well the Royal Shakespeare Company came right out of the blue for me it was an audition um, it was literally a couple of days notice um, John Barton who was going to be doing the Greeks which was going to be the 10, ten plays of the of the Greek and Trojan War and could I go along and do a, a piece for him, um, and I think possibly a modern piece and and a Greek piece. Anyway, I, I had nothing prepared. You know, I thought, oh my god! I went to the library. I got Antigone out or something, and I started to learn it. And I did actually get um, a director friend of mine to come round and just sort of give me a few pointers. And off I went to Floral Street in Covent Garden, where they had their rehearsal rooms. And I did my little bit, and John Barton said to me, did you just learn that? And I said, well, yes. I said, was it that bad? And he said, no, 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 he said, I just wanted to know. I'd just like you to do something that you really, really know. So I said, okay. Our brain was going like this. Well, I'd just done an episode of a thing called Woodhouse Playhouse for Gareth Gwenlan. Um, who was head of comedy at the uh, BBC, and it was a, a PG Woodhouse with John Alderton. And I was playing a character called Lady Millicent Shipton Bellinger. And she had a little dog, and she was frankly, frankly. And I thought, oh, I've, I, I've just done that. I can remember a little speech of her. So I did this little bit of Lady Millicent Shipton Bellinger. And then he said, well, he said, is there anything else you really, really know? So I said, um, well, I, I've got a poem I know by John Betjeman called Sun and Fun, which was the song of a nightclub proprietress, which I knew very well. So I delivered this poem to him. And then he said, now do it drunk. Okay, all right, do it drunk. Now do it, I don't know, something else, something else. Okay, do you dance? Well, I can sort of move, yeah, dance for me, he said. So I was dancing all around the rehearsal room in Floral Street and came to a, came to a, 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 a landing and said, you know, how was that? So then he said, right, he said, I'd like you to, to go home, uh, take the script and learn the speech for me. Well, it was huge. It was a Virginia. So I said, OK. So he said, and then come back next week. So I learned it, came back the next week. We did it. 
he then directed me in it. We had to do it all different sorts of ways and another grueling long audition. Then he said, right, I'd like you to take this home now and do, learn this other speech and come back next week, which I did. We did it. Then I had to meet um, the lady who was doing the choreography and I met her. Then I had to go, um, I met her on the Aldwych stage. And anyway, to cut a long story short, he, at the end of the audition, he came onto the stage and he said, I'd like you to play Iphigenia. And I went, oh, thank you. I thought, right, I'm in the Royal Shakespeare Company, how wonderful. And then he rang me, he, he got my number from my agent and he rang me that night and he said, I am so sorry I put you through all that. But he said, I just wanted to know and to see that you could be directed. Amazing. And that's how it happened. So there I was, we rehearsed the Greeks and it was a long rehearsal. We were because there were 10 plays. Mm. And when you weren't playing your main part, which I was a Phigenia at the beginning when she was very young and then she had to age up at the end of the cycle of the Greek plays. And also then we had to play chorus in, in the other plays. So we were, we were busy all the time. And it, I think the rehearsal period was about 22 weeks. Very long rehearsal. We got to the previews. Um, and suddenly they were looking for somebody to play Juliet. And I sort of didn't think anything of it. And apparently Richard Pascoe and his wife, Barbara Lee Hunt, were in the audience at one of the previews and turned to Ron Daniels, who was directing, and said, there's your Juliet. And then I was summoned to go and meet Anton Lesser, who was playing Romeo. And to audition, I then had to not only audition for, for um, Ron, I had to audition for Terry Hans and Trevor Nunn. They came and watched and everything. And I think it was the opening night of the Greeks, the proper, proper opening. Um, I got a phone call at the stage door, you know, but mobile phones, um, stage door saying, it was Ron Daniel saying, um, I'd like you to play Juliet at Stratford. And I went back to the dressing room and all the girls were there. I said, I've just been offered Juliet at Stratford. And they went, oh, Judy, how wonderful, Judy, how wonderful. And I said, I can't think about it. I can't think, we've got to do this first. <laughs> I was so sort of worried about getting, getting on and doing the Greeks, you know, mm. that my brain wasn't, hadn't quite sort of, it hadn't sunk in. But anyway, that's how it happened. I went off to Stratford, exhausted because I had finished the Greeks and no time off and I, I was very tired and started immediately rehearsals for that. And I, I was with the, the Shakespeare Company um, for three years, all in all, and had a fantastic time then, loved every minute of it. Um, when I think back, I think well, if I'd be offered it now, I don't know, I don't know that I could do it, you know? But you, at the time, you, you, you know, you can do anything when you're younger, can't you? You know, it's, it's great. And it was a very happy time and I learned a lot and, um, enjoyed it. We had lots of voice work with the wonderful Cicely Berry um, and just fantastic directors and the actual productions were wonderful and to be living in Stratford and, and then we went off to Newcastle because they used to take the plays there to the Theatre Royal at Newcastle and then bring them back to the Aldwych and of course the Barbican eventually. I didn't do any plays at the Barbican, but we, we did a production of the Swan Down Gloves, which was specially written by a wonderful actor called Billy Brown, who's sadly no longer with us, but um, the music was Nigel Hess. And it was a pantomime about Shakespeare making his fortune and going to London with his brother Kit, which was me, principal boy, um, and um, meeting all the characters on the way, like Sir Walter Raleigh and, um, oh, and uh, taking the, the gloves, these wonderful gloves that were made from the swans down, from the swans from the Avon. It was a beautiful story and it was very funny and brilliantly done. And we opened, uh, we did a little bit of it to open the Barbican when the Barbican first opened. So that was terrific. Um, so happy, happy days, happy days. We'll stick on the, the theme of performing on, on stage. And you've performed in countless stage productions over the years for the West End to the Old Vic, 
to the Royal Shakespeare Company, which we just obviously discussed, but you've also performed in comedy, serious dry, dramas, adaptations, Shakespeare, Ooh. pantomime as well, which we haven't yeah. touched upon. What, what draws you to the stage and what excites you about performing to a live audience? And do you have a favorite genre or type of role or any writers do you particularly admire? I think comedy on stage is fabulous because you have a rapport with the audience and to hear an audience laugh is magic. I think if you're, um, you can do a wonderful drama and, and hold the audience in the palm of your hand, but to hear laughter rippling through an audience, I think is wonderful. And so um, I was very lucky to be able to work with the wonderful Ray Cooney. And in fact, um, I met Jeff actually on one of his plays, um, my husband, Jeffrey Holland. And fast is a hard thing to do and not everybody can do it. And not a lot of um, experienced um, drama actors, dramatic actors um, find it very difficult. Um, but having worked with the master himself, Mr. Cooney, um, it, it's something I really enjoyed and um, proved to be, you know, good at really, um, blowing my own trumpet, but I think I, think I am. <laughs> um, and so I worked with him in one of his plays in, when was it, 19, I think it was about, I think it was after I left, um, it was early eighties. I did run for your wife for three months in the West End. And uh, that is a fantastic play of his that he's, it, I mean, it's ran in the West End for nine years, I think. And funnily enough, Jeff was in and out of it, but I mean, I'd never met, didn't, met, didn't know him then. And uh, as I say, I just think to hear a, a laughter like that at a, at a farce is fantastic. Funny enough, I'm not so keen on watching them. I prefer, oh, right. okay. I prefer being in them, yeah. Oh, interesting. And then I went on to do um, another of his plays, Funny Money. Uh, we've been on cruise ships doing his plays. We've, we've been to Israel doing his plays. And funnily enough, recently, only a couple of years ago, just before lockdown, um, it was the last one he directed, um, it was Run For Your Wife again, but we called it the geriatric version because we were all too old. He'd upped our ages. He wanted to work with his mates, I think, basically. So Jeff was playing in it. I was one of the wives, um, and Nick Wilton. And we, we did laugh because, because when he asked us, I said, Ray, we're far too old now. No, 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 darling, you'll be fine. <laughs> anyway. The play, it worked, because the play works. It's a funny play. And uh, we also did Move Over Mrs. Markham for him. That's when I worked with Finty Williams, Ju Judy Dench's daughter. Mm. Um, and that was a fantastic production. So yes, laughter, I think, is it's wonderful. This leads on nicely to my next question. Over the course of the, your career, you've worked with many performers, directors, and writers. Who have you found the most inspiring to work with and why? And are there any people you've not worked with that you would like to maybe collaborate with in the future? Uh, well, I was very lucky to work with David Suchet when I was at the RSC. And I played Jessica to his Shylock um, in The Merchant of Venice. And he was wonderful to work with and such a a lovely, lovely man. And also he didn't take himself too seriously. I mean, he, he had a twinkle in his eye a lot of the time. And, you know, I love that, absolutely love that. And he's a, such a good actor. So he was a, one of my favorite people to work with, I have to say. Donald Sindon was another, very naughty he was. He was I played um, Lady Teasel to his, uh, Sir Peter Teasel in School for Scandal at the Haymarket. And we, we did a little tour before we came into London. I think it was only Brighton, Leeds, something like that. And I remember Brighton, it was around about Christmas time. And I, it, it was the, um, the night scene and he, he normally wore a sort of um, nightcap. And mm. I had my sort of negligee on and came in to do this, this scene with him. And I thought, what's Donald got round his head? 
and it looked a bit odd, but he had this sort of hat on him. Anyway, he was fiddling around in his dressing gown pocket and suddenly all these fairy lights lit up around his Well, I was furious. I was absolutely, I couldn't do anything on stage, but the audience, oh, they just thought it was hilarious and they, they all laughed. And this was a very serious sort of scene. And I, I stomped off stage. I was living, and I heard, when I got to my dressing room, I heard him, it was the interval, it was the interval then, and I heard him say, Judy Buxton is never going to speak to me again. <laughs> and Beryl Reed, she was in it, and she came into my dressing room. I think that's absolutely disgraceful. How dare he do that to you? And anyway, we laughed, in the end, we laughed it off. I was cross because I got people in that night, you know, and I wanted it all to be wonderful. And it was, you know, well, they thought it was wonderful, but I was so cross. But it, I loved working with him, really. He was fabulous. And, um, you know, he, he was such fun and so clever, you know. So learn, you learn so much from people like that. Mm. I'm I was, sorry, on the... Do you remember, the... sorry to interrupt, but do you remember... Um, but you do remember um, Bill Bootsy and Snudge? Oh, God, what's his name? Oh, that's terrible, I can't remember his name. Um, no, it'll come to me. But anyway, he was a he he worked um, in this production, and he gave me a reading on a line. He said, "I hope you don't mind, but you'll get a laugh on this." And I tried it, and he was right. And I just went up and said, "Thank you, that was brilliant." So people, you know, I love it when people do help you, and when you're young, you know, a youngster, and you know, you're you're learning. It, well, you, you never stop learning, really. And um, yeah, on the on the flip side to the coin. Is there anyone that you've not worked with, or maybe your paths have crossed in in some ways um, in the past that you would like to maybe work with in the future that you would love to perform alongside? Um, I think I'd love to work with Dame Judy. That would be amazing. That would be wonderful. Or, or Maggie Smith, or you know, one of one of the wonderful stars of our stage and screen um yes i mean who knows in this business you never know who you're going to work with next yeah um, very true. but i would Fingers say crossed. yeah i know so yes i would think somebody like that would be fantastic i want to so many wonderful actors and actresses that one could sort of you know to, to try and suddenly think of somebody off the cuff is hard mm. but um yeah, I think Dame Trudy Dench would be amazing. I wanted to move back to the, the medium of television again. And back in the, the 80s and 90s, you appeared in a, a number of television serials, and mm. some of, of which I mentioned in the introduction at the beginning, By the Sword Divided, mm. Mm. Bergerac, Lovejoy, and On the Up, of course. Mm. What are your memories from appearing in those shows? And do you ever go and go back and actually watch any of those performances? Um, only if they've come up on talking pictures or something. I did do an episode of a thing called Public Eye years ago with um, Alfred Burke. And that came up, I mean, I hadn't seen it for donkey's years because it was back in the seventies. And that came up not so long ago, and I did actually watch it, yes. I, what was so strange was you, you think, well, oh, I only vaguely remember that. Or I don't, I don't remember that. Did I do that? Uh, you know, and there's another one coming up, I think, called Justice. But of course, you can get them all on DVD now, and I've got a few of them, but I don't sort of sit down and, and watch them particularly. I mean, I haven't seen any of my On The Ups for ages. Well, not since, well, I can't remember them. No. I mean, they're there. I've got the box set, <laughs> but I haven't actually sat down and watched them. What was that experience like, working alongside Dennis Waterman? Oh, it was great. I'd worked with Dennis in a tiny, tiny little scene in the Sweeney. Um, that was uh, back in the, blah, blah, blah. I presume it was late 70s, um, maybe early 80s, I can't remember. And um, basically how I got the Omni Up, which was an extraordinary, I went, I went because I went to Rose Bruford's, they had a sort of reunion day. And a friend of mine had said to me, um, oh, Judy, should we go? She was in a, 
a year, a bit below me, I think. And I said, oh, I don't know, I don't really want to go. And she said, oh, come on, if, if we don't like it, we can leave. So I said, okay. So off we went. And there was Gareth Gwenlin there. And I'd mentioned him before. He, he directed me in this Woodhouse Playhouse. And I hadn't seen him for a long while. And I said to him, oh, Gareth, what are you, what are you doing here? So he said, well, I went to Bruford's. I said, I didn't know that. He said, well, it was about 10 years before you. But I, I said, oh, I never knew that. Anyway, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, actually, I'm just about to go and do some filming next week on Lovejoy. Um, didn't think any more of it. It was on a Sunday. Went home. On the Monday, my agent rang me and she said, um, oh, Judy, the, um, Gareth's sending you five scripts of this new thing he's doing called On the Up to play Dennis Wharton's wife. Um, have a look at them. And then he wants to see you at the BBC. So I thought, wow. Anyway, I thought, talk about being in the right place at the right time, you know, I hadn't have gone. Um, so anyway, I read the script, I went and saw him, and we read some of the parts, uh, some of the scenes, and then he said, I just got to clear it with Dennis, because he's got mm. sort of overall, you know, approval. <laughs> and uh, Dennis approved, so that was good. And so I did three series of it, which was lovely. We were working with wonderful Joan Sims and talk about laughs. I mean, in rehearsals, laughs like unbelievable. She was wonderful. She was so lovely, but very nervous on, on the night. You know, she used to get very nervous. And if she made a mistake, she hated it. But of course, the audience loved it. We did have a we had an audience, um, a studio audience and in, on that, which was great. Um, but she used to get incredibly nervous and very upset if she made a, a fluff. But um, it was fun. And Dennis was great. He's, um, you know, I, I adored working with him. He's, he was always friendly with everybody, all the crew. He knew everybody by name, down to the last guy, you know. He was fantastic um, and very professional and, uh, a, you know, really good fun. So it was a lovely time. And uh, again, as I say, it was being in the right place at the right time. Move on next <laughs> to Geoffrey Holland, who you, you married the actor who? back in, <laughs> in 2004. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, how did you first meet and right. had you previously worked together on stage? Well, what happened was we had worked together on a production at Windsor. And that was in, I think it was 94. I think it was 94 or 93. Um, and he was in the cast. It was, um, it was called, it was called The Gingerbread Lady, Neil Simon, a Neil Simon play. And it was with um, Marty Kane. The wonderful Marty. Oh, yeah, Kane. I remember Marty Kane very remember well. Remember Marty Kane. And yeah, she, she was she, wonderful in it. She was fantastic. Um, and we played at Windsor for about three weeks and then we went to Sheffield, which was Marty's hometown, and did a week there. And so I met Jeffrey and, and I just thought, you know, what a very nice man. And he, him going by, he, um, he took me home one day from Sheffield. He, he drove me home. And, I mean, absolutely nothing going on at all. <laughs> he was had a, a marriage. He was uh, married, and I was with somebody that I'd been with for about twenty odd year, twenty two years, and I didn't think anything more of it. And basically, what happened was not long after that, my partner died. Mm -hmm. He had cancer, and um, I remember getting in touch with Jeff just to say, and didn't think any more of it. And he was very sorry and blah, blah, blah. And um, suddenly um, Derek Nimmo's, uh, Derek Nimmo phoned me up and said, would you do a tour for me? Um, it was to do Out of Order by Ray Cooney to take to the Far East and Middle East. And this was around about, about four months after my partner had died. And I thought, oh, this will be good for me to go away and, you know, do some work and have a nice time, blah, blah, blah. And he said, actually, he said, can you think who'd be good at playing the part of 
George Pigden. And I said, well, I'll have a think about it. Anyway, I had a thought about it and I suddenly thought, gosh, Geoffrey Holland would have been, would be very good in that. He'd be marvellous. But I never, I never got back to Derek. I never said anything. And blow me down, I got to rehearsals and who should be playing the part for Geoffrey Holland? <gasps> Amazing. So we went off to the Far East and Middle East. And what I didn't know was that things weren't going very well in his private life. Um, and sort of Cupid fired its little arrow. And uh, there, we, the rest is history, really. We, we were together for um, a few years before we got um, married, 2004, we got married. And uh, yes, um, that, that was the story. It was sort of, thank you, Derek Nimmo, really. Shortly, well, we move on to the final set of questions, which we ask every oh, yeah. single your take guest the same 13 quick fire questions oh my God. wrap up the interview. But my last question, Judy Buxton, oh, right. was what are your plans for the future? Oh. And are there air, any areas you've not worked in that you would like to explore? And then there's a third part to this. Of all the mediums you've worked in, and we've discussed many, film, television, stage, radio, do you have a favourite and why? Right. Favourite medium has to be theatre, because it's what I... I, I knew you were going to say that. It has to be, <clears throat> yeah. Um, what I'd like to do in the future, you can't plan anything in this, uh, you know, you just can't, because it doesn't work out like that. I'd like to do some more television, but I found that, you know, as the years gone on, it's uh, dwindled away quite a bit. Mm. Um, and uh, sadly, you know, it's not what it was really in that the whole thing of self tapes and not going to meet people across a desk, you know, it's, uh, it's all very different and it's all very technical and I'm not very good at all that really, but, you know, <laughs> I do my best. But yes, I mean, I would like to do some more, to do some more television. Um, but really my aim is just to keep working you know, um, if I can. I suppose one loses one sort of um, the actual ambition, you know, it's not the be all and end all of everything, but you know, if it's something that I think is good to do and I feel I'd like to do it, then it would be nice to be out there and doing it. Judy Baxter, we move on to the questions, as I just mentioned, the 13. You don't have to think about these, you know, for any length, and they're just kind of quick fire questions to find out things you might not know about you, things right. you like, things maybe you're not so keen on. Mm. Here we go. Number one, what would you say is your favorite pastime? Pilates. Secondly, we touched upon cinema, we've spoken about some of your film roles, some of the people you've worked with. If you had to choose a favorite film, what would it be and why? West Side Story. Love which, it. Which it, one? The, the, the first one. <clears throat> okay. The original, the original. Love it. Just adore it. The, it's just exciting and wonderful score and wonderful dancing. And yes, that's one of my favourite films. It won the Academy Award, didn't it, as well, for Best Film, I think, oh. in 1961 or two. Yeah. It must be. We move on to books now and novelists. Who would you say is your favourite novelist? Oh, um, do I only have to say one? You can say a few. That's oh, I think, well, <clears throat> during the lockdown, I started rereading uh, all the Harry Potters <laughs> and I just got so into them. So J.K. Rowling, brilliant. It was also, I quite like, um, there's um, a guy called um, Ransom, Ransom Briggs. It's a bit teen, it's a bit teen fiction. Um, it's, um, do you remember the peculiar children, Miss Peregrine and her peculiar children? Yeah, I do, yeah, because they were I made into those. Films, I didn't like yeah. the film, but I, 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 I like his books. So I'm looking forward to the new one if it's coming out soon. Yes. So it's if, all a bit escapism, you know? If you never treaded the boards and became an actress, what 
different profession would you have had or would you have liked to have done? I'd like to have been a makeup artist. So still rather con connected to the profession, but um, a film and TV makeup artist would have, I think would have suited me. Interesting answer because the last um, interview we uploaded was actually with a makeup artist. Ah. Fascinating guy. He's just been nominated for the Academy Award for his work on House of Gucci. Oh, yes. Um, his name's Joran Ludström. He's from Sweden, from Stockholm. Right. He's, um, he's a fascinating person to listen to, really interesting person. But, yeah, an interesting choice there. Hmm. Who would you say in life is your greatest inspiration? Um, I probably have to say my mother, <laughs> in a way. Also, my... My drama teacher um, that I used to go to on the Saturday morning classes, she was a, a, a huge inspiration to me. And her name was Mrs. Mitchell, Mrs. Vera Mitchell. And she was a wonderful woman. And um, she, I think she had faith in me. And uh, yes, yeah, she, she was a great inspiration. I don't think I asked you this during our discussion, but is your mother still alive? No, my mum died in 2014 at the grand old age of 98. Oh, wow. I know, yeah. she did well. And my dad, he died on, in 2002 and he was 94. So they've, had a, they've both had a good innings. We move on to newspapers next. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Well, I don't buy any newspapers. Um, the only reason that I would read the newspaper is that Jeff, does the cryptic crossword every day, every single day, probably apart from Sunday, then it's the Daily Telegraph's cryptic crossword. He doesn't, he doesn't read it for that. He just gets it for the crossword. So it's hanging around and I'll flick through it, but I don't really, I wouldn't say I'm sort of, you know, if, if he didn't do that, I wouldn't go and buy, particularly go and buy a paper. What I'd would you say? What would you say? Are you a cook? And what would you say is your favourite food? Oh, my favourite food is seafood. I love seafood. Scallops and prawns and crab and all that. Yes, I love all that. OK, next one. This stunts a lot of our guests. They always struggle with this one. Mm -hmm. Who in life would you say is your favourite cultural icon? It could be maybe a revolutionary figure from history. It could maybe be a political leader somebody that's changed the world in some capacity with an invention or oh yes people do struggle with this one or a religious leader oh golly um the queen i think I'll I'm, going queen. Say, I'm going to say the queen because i think she's amazing and uh yes I, I think she has always done the most wonderful job and uh i think she's an incredible woman the next one what would you say is your favourite curse word and why? Oh, um, I'm a bit like that Princess Olga Romanov and she's got it embroidered on her cushions. I did, did, don't know whether you saw that programme, The Aristocrats. And she says, bugger fuck shit. You have to say it very quickly, it doesn't sound quite so bad. Bugger fuck shit. That's mine. <laughs> it sounds a bit like an anagram, doesn't it, when you do it? That, um, it does, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What would you say next is your favourite place or holiday destination? Oh, um, I've been lucky enough to go to the um, Far East and the Middle East, and um, I absolutely adored Muscat in Oman. Yeah. Beautiful. I loved it there. I'd love to go back. Move on to music. We haven't spoken about music at all. Who is your favourite music artist, or you can name a few? Mm -hmm. And what is your all-time favourite album? Um, well, I love the Beatles. I was a Beatles girl rather than a Stones, you know. Um, and I love Ella Fitzgerald. I oh, she had an incredible voice. Oh, amazing. Um, and for favourite albums, I, I actually really enjoy or love um, Rod Stewart's great, uh, the, the great British songbook. Great American Songbook, isn't it? Not the Great British Songbook. Um, yeah, so that again, it's all those Ella, Ella Fitzgerald, Cole Porter type 
songs, mm. you know, the old, the old fashioned songs I like. Judy Buxton, I have to be a little bit biased because I love music and Ooh. I have to say the Beatles is a very fine choice. Oh, and good. I think they probably be up there as my top. I was yeah. absolutely obsessed with them when I was about Are 20. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, I always wanted to be a Beatle. I thought they were just, just the, how they changed during that 60s decade from pretty much being a covers band at the start and then from sort of rubber soul onwards, how it all changed. And they, I just always felt there were some great bands in the 60s. Mm. But for me, they're always a few steps steps ahead of the others. And that's not discredited any of the bands like the Stones or the, the Hollies and the Kinks. They did great stuff, but I always felt the Beatles were just that. Yeah. yeah do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. They kind of, they kind of set the, the bar was, uh, they kind of set the level, didn't they? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Um, ne next one, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Oh, um, <laughs> I think I think playing um, I think playing Juliet at the RSC would be up there with the, with them. Yep. And then, lastly, Judy Buxton, <laughs> how do you wish to be remembered? How do I wish to be remembered? I think. She did, she did her best at everything she went for and as a good friend. Judy Buxton, thank you kindly for taking part in today's interview. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. You've been a joy, an absolute joy to interview. Oh, bless you. Um, because you're very honest up front. You're very funny as well. <laughs> and some of your stories have been interesting and put a, a smile on my face so thanks a lot for for taking part and I hope I hope you do land more tv roles in the, the future because yeah. I'd love to see you thank on the you. television performing again thank you very much James that's lovely I've enjoyed it oh thanks a lot and lastly mm -hmm. where have you got any future performances on stage where we where can we find out more about you and your work and see um, you live on stage well, we're doing a little tour of a thing called Best of British, which encompasses all sitcoms. And um, it's it's um, going to go to a few places. I think it's all on our website. Um, Jeff's doing it. It's all about, you know, the sitcoms that we've done. Sue Hodge it, from Allo Allo, she's, she's with us. And then um, we've got Debbie Hudd, you know, Roy Hudd's widow. She is going to be interviewing us. So we're going to various little venues. There's a couple in May. We're going to um, Bishop Stortford and, um, oh, I don't think I've got my list here, but it is all, it is on the website. So that's on um, Geoffrey Holland's website and on my website, Judy Buxton. Um, and we're taking, I think we've got a few dates in September and October as well. So bits, bits and bobs. I, I've been doing a one woman show, but sadly I couldn't do it. Um, I, I have done it, but um, I was, had a performance last week and I got the dreaded COVID, so I couldn't, uh, could, had to bow out of it. But I'm hoping that, we haven't got any more dates in the diary for that yet, but I'm hoping that uh, I will be able to do it. And it's, a, it's a three monologues. And the title of the actual show is women of pensionable rage and it's three very very different women having a lot to shout about <laughs> it's very funny and entertaining as well as some of it's quite some um, poignant as well but it's uh, it lasts about an hour and uh you know it's all, all new but uh it went very well and i have performed it mm -hmm. and um hopefully fingers crossed we'll do it again all the very best with the, the rest of your day and thank you for taking an hour or so out of your day to be a guest on your take. My pleasure. Thank you, James. Thank you. Take care.